Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Patriots History. I'm Larry Swigart, co-author of Patriots History with Michael Allen, and your host here as we read through Patriots History of the United States. And um, we are using, as always, the 15th anniversary edition. If you have a different edition, it'll still work. You'll be okay. But you've got to find the headers because the page numbers aren't going to align. Uh, in other news, uh, I am working on an update of this that I'm going to try to get out later this summer. I have to keep working on my book, Globalism, The Rise and Decline of Globalism, uh, for Skyhorse Books. That will be put out next, uh, I think, February, March by Steve Bannon and Skyhorse. But I'm trying to get this update done by the end of the summer. I'm also working on a long-term book called America in the 21st Century. So it'll be out by 2025. I know you guys are going, Swikart, are you going to live that long? Hey, trust me, I'll be around when many of you are pushing up daisies. Finally, remember that we've got an amazing trailer for this to turn it into The Chosen or John Adams. I have an idea for a great series. I've got screenwriters, I've got filmmakers, I've got cameramen, I've got everybody ready to go. I just need some cash. So watch the trailer. If you like it, kick in some money. This has been a very good campaign so far. And I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to get this funded. So check it out. The Buy Larry a Coffee button is on the wild world of history. Okay, let's get started. We are on page 115. And I'm starting the new header, Two Streams of Liberty. Two Streams of Liberty. I like this when we wrote it. I really like this section. Well before the Revolutionary War ended, strong differences of opinion existed among Whig patriots. While the majority favored the radical state constitutions, the Articles of Confederation, and legislative dominance, a minority viewpoint arose. Detractors of the radical constitutionalism voiced a more moderate view, calling for increased governmental authority and more balance between the executive, judicial, and legislative branches at both the state and the national levels. During this time, the radicals called themselves Federalists because the Articles of Confederation created the weak federal union they desired. Moderates lab labeled themselves Nationalists. All right, did you catch this? We've always been told that those who favored the Articles were the Anti-Federalists and those who favored the new constitution were the federalists watch what happens <clears throat> moderates labeled themselves nationalists denoting their commitment to a stronger national state these labels were temporary and by 1787 the nationalists would call themselves federalists meaning they favored a federal structure of federal state local control and in high irony they labeled their original Federalist opponents anti-Federalists. Now, if you know anything about psychology or polling or anything like that, you can't be anti-anything. I don't care how good your position is. You can't be anti-abortion. You have to be pro-life. You can't be for abortion. I would say for killing babies. You've got to be pro-choice. So. The pro has to always supersede the anti. In this case, the nationalists managed by calling themselves federalists to pin a label on those who favored less central government of anti-federalists. It's one of the greatest public relations moves in American history, and it was totally effective. The Nationalist faction included Robert Morris, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Henry Knox, Rufus King, and their leader, Alexander Hamilton. We should throw in George Washington. These men found much wanting at both the state and national levels of government. They wanted to broaden the taxation and commercial regulatory powers of the Confederation Congress, while simultaneously curtailing what they perceived as too much democracy at the state level. Quote, America must clip the wings of a mad democracy, wrote Henry Knox. John Adams, retreating from his 1776 radicalism, concurred. He said, quote, there never was a democracy that did not commit suicide, unquote. The people, Hamilton snorted. 
The people are a great beast. Yet it could not be assumed that this anti-democratic language was monarchical or anti-revolutionary in nature, because Hamilton himself would also refer to, quote, the majesty of the multitude. Rather, the nationalist criticism reflected a belief in republicanism, not democracy, republicanism as a compromise before the tyranny of a monarch, and what James Madison feared to be a, quote, potential tyranny of the majority. It was a philosophical stance dating back to Aristotle's distinction between the polis, a good government by the many, and a democracy, an abusive government by the many. Nationalists concluded that the spirit of 76 had become too extreme. <clears throat> At the state level, nationalists attacked the actions of all powerful legislatures produced by expanded suffrage, that is the vote. They were also disturbed when seven states issued inflated currency and enacted legislation that required creditors to accept these notes, leading to scenes in which debtors literally chased fleeing creditors attempting to pay them in spurious money. Here, you got to take this money. No, I don't want that money. That money's useless. And, you know, your debt must be settled in money that has value. Additional, quote, debtors laws granted extensions to farmers who would have otherwise lost their property through default during the post-war recession. Now, we see a lot of that happening recently with the China virus uh, laws and all of the various things that were put out there to protect people during the China virus pandemic from um, debtors, from landlords, things like that. And the problem is, at some point, the landlords and the creditors run out of money. Uh, this works only so long as they are willing to take a loss. Uh, today, for example, we are seeing in San Francisco a very clear example of this, where one after another of these big companies are leaving, Macy's and all sorts of other companies, are leaving downtown San Francisco because there aren't enough people there to sustain their business because the Local government there won't enforce the laws because the homeless and drug addicted people are outside the buildings and because no one can afford to live there. Um, and if you can't throw people out and get in new tenants, you're out of luck. So this is a, a very current problem, but it's a very old problem as we see here. Reaction to the state-generated inflation is explainable in part by the composition of the nationalists, many of whom were themselves creditors in one way or another. Don't forget the revolution had to be funded by somebody, folks. People like Robert Morris basically went broke trying to fund the revolution. So there's nothing wrong with them saying, hey, I put everything into this. I need to be able to get a little bit back. But an underlying concern for the contractual agreements also influenced the nationalists, who saw state meddling in favor of debtors as potentially debilitating violation of property rights. Remember, one of the four pillars of American exceptionalism is private property with written titles and deeds. And contracts within that property include, if I rent you this space, you must pay me your rent. And people weren't doing that, or they were trying to pay in money that had no value whatsoever. So we're on page 116 now. When it came to government under the Articles of Nationalists aimed their sharpest jabs at the unstable leadership caused by term limits and the annual elections. A role existed for a strong executive and a permanent judiciary, they contended, especially when it came to commercial issues. The Confederation's economic policy, like those of the states, had stifled the nation's enterprise, a point they hoped to rectify through taxation of international commerce, though through important import tariffs. Significantly, the new nationalists largely espoused the views of Adam Smith, who, although making the case for less government interference in the economy, also propounded a viable but limited role for government in maintaining a navy and an army capable of protecting trade lanes and national borders. Weakness in the articles also appeared on the diplomatic front, 
where America was being bullied despite its newly independent status. The British refused to evacuate their posts in the old Northwest, claiming the region would fall into anarchy under the United States. They probably weren't wrong. Farther south, the Spanish flexed their muscles in the lower Mississippi Valley, closing the port of New Orleans to the booming American flatboat and keelboat trade. Congress sent nationalist John Jay to negotiate a settlement with Spain's Don Diego de Gardoqui. Far from intimidating the Spaniards, Jay offered to suspend American navigation in the Mississippi for 25 years and return for a trade agreement favorable to his northeastern constituents. Western anti-nationalists were furious, but had to admit that without an army or a navy, the Confederation Congress is powerless to coerce belligerent foreign powers. Nevertheless, Congress could not swallow the J. Gardoki Treaty and scrapped it. Now we have one of the very few remaining sidebars in here. Remember, these are things that were set apart for us to get into detail in certain topics <clears throat> that we thought didn't work their way easily into the text narrative. And this one is on Mike Fink, King of the River. The complicated issues of politics in the 1780s were paralleled by real, related real-life drama far removed from the scenes of government. For example, shortly after John Jay negotiated with Spain's Don Diego de Gardoqui over American trading rights on inland rivers, Big Mike Fink was pioneering the burgeoning river traffic of the Ohio and Mississippi, Mississippi rivers. Fink gained such a mighty reputation during America's surge west of the Appalachians that he was dubbed King of the River. And he makes a, an appearance in the Walt Disney, the very old Walt Disney uh, Davy Crockett series where Crockett and Mike Fink battle it out on a keelboat race. Back in the days before steam power, the produce of the American frontier, pork, flour, corn, animal skins, whiskey, was shipped up and down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers on thousands of flatboats and keelboats. Flatboats were crude flat bottom craft that could travel only downstream. Often they were broken up when they reached New Orleans. Keelboats were sleeker 60 foot craft that could be pulled upstream by the Herculean efforts of their crewmen. Literally, you uh, walk to the back of the boat and you, uh, you walk forward and push the boat forward as you go, then you walk all the way back, push the boat forward. Uh, it, it's akin to pulling yourself up, except you're using these long poles to push yourself up the river. Early rivermen lived hard lives enduring the hazards of fog, ice, snags, sandbars, waterfalls, even Indian attacks as they plied their trade <clears throat> in the early West. Upon sale of their cargoes in Natchez or New Orleans, most rivermen walked back to their Ohio Valley homes via the Natchez Trace, braving the elements and attacks from outlaws. <clears throat> Mike Fink so captured the public imagination that oral legends of his exploits spread far and wide, and ultimately they found their way into print in newspapers and almanacs. According to these stories, Fink was half horse, half alligator, could outrun, outhop, outjump, throw down, drag out, and lick any man in the country. Remember, we had a discussion earlier about Americanistic terms. How many of these do you see in this line that he could um, outhop, outjump, throw down, drag out, and lick? Those are all American terms. The British didn't use any of those. In some tales, Fink outfoxed wily farmers and businessmen, cheating them out of money and whiskey. He could ride dangerous bulls, one of which he said, quote, drug me over every briar and stump in the field. The most famous off-repeated Mike Fink story was one in which he, a la William Tell, shoots a whiskey cup off a friend's head. <clears throat> These are good yarns, and some of them were no doubt true. But who was the real Mike Fink? Born near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, at the headwaters of the Ohio River around 1770, Fink grew into a fine woodsman, rifleman, frontier scout. He took up boating around 1785 and rose in the trade. He mastered the difficult business of keelboating, 
poling, rowing, sailing, and cordling, pulling via a rope, winch, keelboats upstream for hundreds of miles against strong currents of the western rivers. Fink plied the Ohio and Mississippi during the very time frontier Americans angrily disputed Spanish control of America's downriver trade. By the early 1800s, Fink owned and captained two boats headquartered at Wheeling, West Virginia. Working his way west, Fink's career paralleled that of American expansionism into the Mississippi Valley, while at the same time reflecting on the coarse and violent nature of the American frontier. One of the few documented accounts of the historic Mike Fink is an early 19th century St. Louis newspaper story of his shooting the keel off a black, I'm sorry, the heel off of a black man's foot. Responding to an advertisement in the March 22, 1822 St. Louis, Missouri Republican, which called for, quote, 100 young men to ascend the Missouri River to its source, unquote, and establish a fur trading outpost in Montana country. Fink was hired to navigate one of the company's keelboats up the Missouri, working alongside the legendary mountain man Jedediah Smith. An 1823 feud between Fink and two fellow trappers flared into violence that led to Fink's murder. This ended the actual life of the king of the river, but mythical Mike Fink had only begun to live. He soon became a folk hero whose name was associated in the same breath with Daniel Boone, Andrew Jackson, and Davy Crockett. Celebrated in folklore and literature, Mike Fink's legend was assured when he made it into the 1956 Walt Disney movie. Actually, it wasn't a movie. It was a television series. But And uh, you can see much of this reference in Mike Allen's book, The Western Rivermen, 1763 to uh, 1861. And... Um, subtitled The Mississippi Boatman and the Myth of the Alligator Horse. Returning to our text on page 117. Nationalists held mixed motives in their aggressive critique of the government under the Articles of Confederation. Honest champions of stronger government, they advanced many valid political and economic and military and diplomatic ideas, their opponents perhaps correctly call them reactionaries who sought to enrich their own merchant class. True, critics of the Articles of Confederation represented the commercial and cosmopolitan strata of the new nation. It just so happened that for the most part, the long-range interests of the young United States coincided with their own. Throughout the early 1780s, nationalists unsuccessfully attempted to amend the Articles. Congress's Treasury Chief Robert Morris twice proposed a 5% impost tax, a tariff, but Rhode Island's solo resistance defeated the measure. Next, he offered a plan for privately owned National Bank to manage fiscal matters, and again, 12 states concurred, but not Rhode Island. Matters came to a head in September 1786. When delegates from the five states bordering the Chesapeake Bay convened in Annapolis, Maryland, ostensibly to discuss shared commercial problems. The nationalists among the Annapolis Convention delegates proceeded to plant the seed of peaceful counter-revolution against the Confederation Congress. Delegates unilaterally called for a new meeting of representatives of all 13 states to occur in Philadelphia in the spring of 1787. Although these nationalists no doubt fully intended to replace the existing structure, they worded their summons to Philadelphia in less threatening tones, claiming only to seek agreements on commercial issues and to propose changes, quote, that may require a correspondent adjustment of other parts of the federal system, unquote. The broadest interpretation of this language points only to amending the Articles of Confederation, although Hamilton and his allies had no such aim. They intended nothing less than replacing the Articles with a new federal constitution. In that light, Rufus King captured the attitudes of many of those former revolutionaries when he wrote of the delegate selection, quote, for God's sake, be careful who are the men who attend this. Now, I'm going to make some enemies here. That's okay. Do it all the time. I do not support a con con. I do not support a constitutional convention. I don't care what rules it's brought under. The history 
right here shows us that it is all about those men. Be careful who are those men. Whoever attends the concon, not the language they are sent there with, will decide what happens in the concon. And folks, I'm here to tell you the first thing they will do will abolish that will be to abolish the Second Amendment. Bet your life on this. The, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The second thing they will do. The first thing they will do will be to agree to meet in secret so nobody knows what they're doing. I should have said that because that's the first thing these guys did. When they met to discuss the articles, the first thing they did was it to agree to meet in secret. So second thing a con con would do would be to abolish the Second Amendment. I kid you not. And, and so let me just put it to you this way. I know there's a lot of people who like this idea <clears throat> and think, oh, no, they'd have to bring it back for ratification. We see how the ratification contest went with the first Constitution. And I like the Constitution, but I'm just saying you can't count on the ratification. It's all about who are those men. So let me ask you this. I'm, I'm being really straight with you here. You complain because you can't control your state legislatures in many cases and can't. You, can, you complain because you can't control your state senators and you can't. <clears throat> many of you complain because you can't control the governor and you can't. Then you complain because you can't control your house representative or at least many of those around him or her and you can't. And then you complain that you can't control your U.S. Senator, and you can't. So, folks, how in the world are you going to guarantee you can control the delegates to this convention? Now, I'm going to give you a name, a couple of names. You know from the conservative side <clears throat> who would end up being a delegate to a con, -con? Mitt Romney, Paul Ryan, somehow, don't ask me how. Somehow, because these guys are involved in all the little webs and they would get nominated. And if there's 500 delegates, you can bet 400, 400 of them are going to be Mitt Romney's and Paul Ryan's. Just saying. So I do not favor a con con. I think it would immediately get out of hand and every protection that you think you've devised so far would be gone like that. Just like it was the first time. And thank God, those men that we sent to that first convention in Philadelphia were great men, smart men, patriotic men. You would not have the same people attending a concom in 2024 or 2025. Just saying. Now, you can write me all the nasty letters you want to. Uh, I, I'm here, Larry at wildworldhistory.com. I get it. I've heard the arguments. Reality is something different. Reality is if you can't control all those other people that you supposedly should have control over, how are you going to magically control this particular group of delegates? You won't. So next time we're going to get into the Constitution and look at the creation of the U.S. Constitution and how that worked. And until then, remember, go to the wild world of history Become a VIP member. There are so many lessons ongoing in VIP. Um, uh, the horrible history of Howard Zinn, how Howard Zinn became a terrible source for so many people. Uh, enduring lessons on life and citizenship. Folks, this is great for your kids. Just two of the lessons alone are fantastic. Time and money, the connection between time and money that you don't hear in school. Or capitalism and socialism. You're not going to get this explanation anywhere else. Trust me. I taught for 31 years. I went to all the seminars, all the conferences. I listened to some very great teachers, including Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, many others. You're not going to hear this explanation anywhere else. And it's so basic. It's so simple. So check out those lessons. They're in the VIP, which is $6 a month, $69 a year. It's a deal. And I'm adding new courses in integrity, featuring Winston Churchill, George Washington, many others. And then we'll be adding later on Patriot's History of Globalism, its rise and decline. You're going to want to check it out. In the meantime, 
go to the video and buy Larry a coffee. I'll see you guys back here on Monday.